Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mercatus Podcast Digital Grocer, episode 32. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrier, president and CEO of Mercatus Technologies, and joining me in the studio today is Mark Ferris, our senior director of marketing. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. <laughs> I go. I went. So, I'm always here, dude. I went so hard on that intro, right? It was that, like that was very professional. Yeah, I know, but it's been a while since we. I know <laughs> we've recorded. Yeah. I've been I, dodging diseases <laughs> for the last two weeks because there was only yeah. I think once or twice that you said I was sequestered. Yeah, and it wasn't because of anything current in the news. No, not at all. No. You were just self sequestering yourself. Right. <laughs> Nothing to do with diseases. No. But we just got back from the NGA show in San yep. Diego. Yep. It was kind of an interesting show. I, I walked the trade show floor, took me roughly, uh, probably 20, 30 minutes. In parts of the show floor were quiet and the other parts were a lot busier. Mm -hmm. We had two retailers that had booths, IGA, mm -hmm. Save A Lot Foods, which was kind of interesting. I'm not sure if they were innovation hubs or so on, but I think COVID-19, because we want to be nice to our friends at the Corona Beer, I think it put a damper a bit on the mood. Yeah, and it wasn't as prevalent in the news as it is now mm -hmm. and that was and really it's just a few weeks ago yeah it, it's really interesting you know up, up until about while i was still kind of i guess held up in wuhan right in china we hadn't really thought about the impacts on europe the middle east mm -hmm. north america how it may affect us so the news you know we had some great announcements you know amazon came out with their first larger format grocery store and roughly mm -hmm. almost 11,000 square feet. Yeah. A little more conventional than people were expecting. A little bit more conventional. Yeah. I think that's maybe the play moving forward. I was thinking on hopping on a plane to go to Seattle to to kind of check it out and take some pictures and maybe write a couple of blog posts. But this whole COVID-19, I think, has taken the industry yeah. by yeah. one big fail swoop. And I think the really big challenge is right now, talking to some Canadian and U.S. retailers, they underestimated the impact and the scare would create, and now they're starting to protect the supply chain. That's right. It's critical. It's critical. I don't know if you saw it today. Target just joined Kroger in an announcement. They're going to start limiting the number of items uh, so people can buy. On bulk order or? That? It didn't specify, but right. I think it's a lot of it. You know, in Canada, you know, close to my home, mm -hmm. Loblaws, Sobeys, and Longos, they were out of toilet paper. Yeah, I was at Costco on the weekend, and it was just flying off the skids. People were like... Four, five, I don't think six. you should say toilet paper and skids at the same, <laughs> the same <laughs> sentence. I don't think that's appropriate. The pallets. The pallets, Sorry. yeah, yeah. In some cases, I will tell you the Loblaws Superstore, they were bringing out the pallets directly in, not stocking the shelves whatsoever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. And it's not a cut box format type of retailer, the yeah. Superstore, right, compared to their no frills banners. Well, I mean, how do you manage your supply chain in a situation where there's hoarding going on? Well, how do you manage your supply chain yeah. when you can't get product in? True. That's true. that's the bigger yep. issue, right? Yep. And if you think here in Canada, we're even more dependent on certain sources outside of the country because of the fact of winter. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our manufacturing when it comes to certain products has completely disappeared and gone true, south. True, true. You know, and this is that's had an impact on business in general. If you look at some of the larger trade shows that occur in this industry, if you think Shop Talk that is in March, then you have Grocery Shop in September. Mm -hmm. Those have been shifted. Correct. And this is post a new acquisition, right? Because the group that actually started those shows has been acquired. Correct. And now we don't know about I3. No. Just yet. Or Home Delivery World is presumably still moving forward. Right. I guess depending on what the implications are regionally. Yeah. South by Southwest is canceled, for goodness That's sakes. right. And now we have the price war on the barrel of oil yep. between uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, mm -hmm. which I don't think any uh, economist... Uh, could have foreseen and this is uh, not helping the situation in no, the market no. but you know, the one advice i would give to anyone is you know you have to have a long view when it comes to the market and we've been through this before i mean this is reminiscent of 08 reminiscent of 91 yeah the markets tend to bounce back and you know there is a lot of fear being propagated out there right now we're a bit more fortunate here in canada specifically in toronto we had the 2003 scare of sars um, so our healthcare system is properly prepared. They have the protocols. They've seen this before. Yes. And you know, thank goodness for that in a bizarre way. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know this. Next week, we will have separate screening centers outside of the main emergency rooms and the larger hospitals here. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. One on the east side of the mm -hmm. city and one on the west side. Wow. So those are going to be set up as well. So specifically dedicated for screening people that may have COVID-19. 
Now, the one thing that came out of this, I don't know if we and I talked about this, but there's the rumor that Instacart is looking at setting up MFCs. Really? Where did you hear that? Well, so I have a couple of people that call me that are pretty big in the investment community saying right. that they've heard the case of Instacart likely investing in MFCs and so on. Interesting. It's very interesting. I'm not Cause, sure. Because we know Amazon is using Domatic. Yes. That's what the supposition is. That's right. In their new retail format. That's right. That's right. So I wouldn't know who Instacart is using mm-hmm. or how the retailers may react to this, but I'm sure we'll find out some more as this develops and we'll let our, our listeners know. Now, I will tell you one thing that was surprising here in Mercatus when this whole notion or the whole thing about COVID-19 kind of hit the West Coast, starting off in Washington and then mm-hmm. you know, slowly making its way through California, we saw an immediate spike in online sales Correct. coming yep. through our platform. Yep. And the one thing that really kind of blows my mind, you know, in our case, right, if, if I go back and I look at one of our projects, Smart and Final, and we had Ed Wong, the CIO or Chief Digital Officer of Smart Final on one of our episodes, probably episode 28. Mm-hmm. He talked about the complexities of orchestration and how Mercatus brought together, shipped, and T-Force. T-Force, T-Force yep. really for the larger, more B2B style formats. Right. And I'm watching these sales go online and, and kind of rapidly increasing in terms of size of the basket, frequency of the orders, and then the, we were asked to increase the number of time slots for delivery and for pickup. And you start to really think through as volume increases, the complexities of orchestration. And if you're doing delivery, the number of delivery providers you may have, then you get into really, really interesting science, route optimization, determining where the driver is. If there's going to be an affected refund because somebody right. didn't want something in their order or just returning the order in yep. general. Yep. This space isn't occupied by a lot of organizations. And when you go out on the internet and you start searching for these things, there's not a lot of real modern organizations that think API based, that think platform, that think scalability. And that are SaaS focused. Well, that are yeah. software as a service. Right? That's very rare, yeah. quite yeah. frankly, in this yeah. space here, because there's a lot of older players, I would say, in this right. space. We've been fortunate enough uh, here at Mercatus. They were connected to a pretty large web of some amazing organizations. Mm-hmm. And we thought it would be best to bring someone in that can talk about the complexities of this space. So we're super pumped to bring on board in a conversation with us today, Bring. Now, for those of you who have no clue who Bring is, it's the leading delivery logistics solution providing enterprise with the most efficient way to manage their complex delivery operations. And I got to tell you, having done a couple of these projects, if you're not using a platform like Bring, it just makes your life that much more difficult. And in some of the world's best known brands in more than 50 countries are actually using their platform and really changing the way they do business and hitting their key milestones and revenue. Now, to help us understand this whole space, we're joined on the phone from Israel, the CEO of Bring, Guy Block. Guy brings a wealth of experience. I've read some of the stuff that he's written, his latest blog post. Last year, he gave me a copy of a book at Home Delivery World in Philadelphia that they wrote. And it's been amazing. And he's really in charge of that rapid evolution of his own organization. And now prior to Bring, Guy worked for Splunk. We use Splunk here at the office. It's a bit of a mainstay in the world of DevOps. And it's a leading software platform for machine data. And prior to that, he held a tremendous number of senior leadership roles and really kind of affected the space. Guy, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you share with our audience a little history of Bring and the market it serves and what does it really offer grocery retailers? Yeah, for sure. Bring is a the leading, I would say, delivery orchestration platform uh, that serves many vertical and uh, many markets, including uh, retail, groceries, oversized logistics, field services, and uh, logistics providers. We actually help a number of leading grocers to efficiently and cost-effectively manage the growing, what we call the growing curbside and delivery offering. Delivery grocery is growing and many grocers are increasingly looking to provide exceptional delivery experiences without cutting into margins. And this is exactly what we are here to do, to help all those merchants out there thrive in the age of Amazon, the growing customer expectation by helping them transform the way they fulfill their orders. And so what do you see as the challenges in in last mile delivery? 
Well, I see many challenges. Obviously, it's not one. The world is going through a major transformation into a digital world, and that requires many changes for the market players. In, for example, the e-commerce tractions. You know, some brands have established a clear lead in digital groceries. For example, Walmart and Instacart and Amazon. And now retail grocery incumbents, they need to create a compelling digital offering and drive customers to try it. If they don't do that, they will just feed the fastest growing grocery segment, which is really digital. So that's a good example. And another you know, challenge that we see is the delivery cost. When you use the traditional model, it often you know, costs you 20 to 25% more than, you know, it takes you more in terms of percentage to deliver than what a consumer will be willing to pay for that same day delivery, right? So how do you make this work in a two to three percent margin business? That's definitely a challenge. We've seen already that when, you know, when you push the customer at the cost on the customer, they just simply don't buy. You know, you're going to picking in the fulfillment, which is very relevant to groceries, to some degree could be less relevant to other verticals. There, when we work with customers, we see the retail disruption and we see that the fulfillment from retail inventory is a challenge. Ensuring picking efficiencies for delivery orders, you know, it often comes with, at the expense of a positive in-store experience for customers. Cost, again, just manual order picking from retail can be, you know, very expensive. Retail traditionally set up to increase the card value, but not for efficiency. And again, efficiency, we see that as a, as a challenge that comes back and forth. You know, even timing and storage is a big challenge there, right? The number one reason shoppers select digital groceries is convenience. And to meet this convenience, grocers must manage flows across picking, staging, curbside, and delivery across, uh, you know, in-house and third-party drivers. And all of that just to meet the customer expectations. And that's definitely a, another challenge. And then, of course, uh, you know, all the MFCs, the Micro Fulfillment Center promise, you know, they promise better automation. It will be interesting to see how they perform in the real world. So we, we yet to see how that comes to play and how we can start, still drive the customer experiences with the efficiency. Yeah, this is a good point. You know, the challenge that I see with the in the realm of MFCs, and Mark and I were talking about this, is it's one thing to consider implementing an MFC, but reality is do you have the support infrastructure around you to manage that MFC or to deal with it if something goes wrong? Now, in the, ca in the case of your technology, where do retailers or where are they on their maturity scale when they bring you guys in are they typically they're starting off in you know grocery e-commerce or they've dabbled with this for 15 years and they realize hey there's a great opportunity here for us to make money we just need to do it more profitably and we want to bring a solution like bring to really help us streamline that but help me understand where are they in their journey yeah, it's interesting. We actually worked on the maturity model and uh, we had a lot of conversations also with Gartner on the maturity of the market. And we're looking at that as five uh, phases. The number one is basic delivery that you do manually. Number five is deliver like Amazon or Instacart, which means you fully digitized and you fully connected and orchestrated. And at that point, you get to very high automation and optimization as you're creating the customer experiences at scale. What we're finding is, depending on the verticals, what we find, first of all, customers, they realize they need to move into delivery. If they don't go into delivery and offer numerous delivery options, it's no longer enough to deliver in a couple of days. You need to do click and collect, curbside, same day, next day, in some cases, 30 minutes if you're a restaurant, two hours. So, so if you cannot offer that to your customers, that digital experience with a convenience, cost-effective and fast delivery, your customers will go eventually to, to marketplaces. And they might buy your product, your brand, your food, your groceries, but when they don't buy that directly from you, they actually buy that from the marketplace. You lose the customer. It's no longer your customers. Uh, it's no longer your customer. You lose their data, and data is imperative in the digital world and in our world today. 
uh, you clearly lose the upsell and cross-sell uh, opportunity because it's not your customers, so you don't control their shopping experience. And then, of course, you pay very high margin. So when they come and they make the decision that they want to go and start attracting the customers to come back and buy from them, they understand they need to give more delivery options, they need to provide nationwide coverage, because delivering in Chicago and New York, or if you deliver in rush hours or off business rush hours, for the customer it doesn't matter, SLA is SLA. 30 minutes is 30 minutes, two hours is two hours. And obviously they need to do so much more for that. Also, of course, everything has to be in real time. So they need to see the orders, they need to see the inventory, they need to see the stores and the warehouses, they need to see the different fleets they're using. Maybe they use their drivers, maybe they use someone else's driver. They need to see it in real time. And then, of course, their customers, in order to make very quick decisions, again, to create the customer experience with very high efficiency. So what we're finding is that some of the customers just dipping their toes in the water, and that means it's a long journey, and uh, we have a very clear implementation methodology to take them step by step and get more and more proficient in how they do that. But in other cases, we work with customers that are already wired to deliver from thousands of stores and MSCs, but at the same time, it's just not efficient. And for them to reduce that cost, they have to move into full orchestration that everything, you know, millions of decisions are made every day automatically and in the most optimized way. In some cases, I mean, I mean, you've been in this space for quite some time. And I'm sure you have a collection of amazing war stories and customer experience and delivery experiences specifically really drives behavior. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing out there in terms of examples of a negative grocery delivery experience? On the negative side, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting one. I tell you, you know, in North America, the bar is being set pretty high, you know, by Walmart, Amazon, and Instacart. And when you think about delivery experiences, uh, we know that the numbers are tough. If you think about it, right, over 84% of consumers today will not return to a brand after a negative experience. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough number to deal with. If you think about digital grocery shoppers, you know, they are really there for the convenience, right? right? And you have to now look at every step in your customer journey. And you need to ask yourself how you can make it easier from online ordering to returns and customer service. This can turn into a positive experience but also into a very negative one if you don't do that efficiently. And then once again, falling into the 84% of the customers that will not come back to you, you're not at risk of losing customers. So you're trying to do something right for your customers, but mistakes across the process can actually cost you the customer that you just tried to save. You know, communications and visibility, I think also play a role here. Grosses need to ensure that they have the right communication and processes in place to provide full transparency to their customers, you know, from when the order is being picked to the substitution management, and when it leaves the stores until it arrives at the customers, and when the customer wants to return a damaged or unwanted item. If that experience is not smooth, you fall back again into that 84% of customers that will not forgive you. So we think all of that, and when we come in with our platform, you know, be part of our implementation methodology. The first thing, the first couple of weeks, we sit down and really take the time to understand the business logic and the use case that the customer is trying to, to create. We understand the business processes, the rules, the exceptions. When we have a clear understanding of that, as well as mapping all the different data sources we need to integrate with, this is where we stand up the MVP and then we move into the field and start testing that. And that's where you start seeing and we usually tell the customers, don't boil the ocean. Let's start with few locations to perfect them. But once we perfect them, you can really go to scale. So with us, when we go through this process, we allow those mistakes in very limited scope. And we work together with the customer and the different stakeholders that are involved in the process to perfect their template. And only then they can really scale. And I'm, I've seen customers scale to 7,000 stores in literally one month. 
but the core is really figure out the perfect template. Yeah. And only when it's fine tuned, yeah. you roll it out, and then you can avoid those negative experiences. Now, I'm always curious to ask a, a fellow CEO a question. When you think in terms of delivery and orchestration, and you look into your crystal ball to kind of gauge the future, what are you seeing as being some of those major innovations or what may come out of the market? Wow, another good question. I, I would tell you, and this is something I've been seeing a lot with our customer base today, because regardless if you are a restaurant owner or a restaurant chain or a grocer, a large grocer, or maybe even a, a big auto part vendor or a, a phone company and on and on, what we do for them, we're creating what we like to call this mini coalition uh, for them. It's a it's group of allies that we bring in terms of their supply chain. Uh, it can be flexible warehousing, it can be crowdsource or parcel or 3PLs, it can be different inventory methodologies and technologies, but when you bring it all together and you put it around the vendor, around the customer, what we see is that when all of that comes to work in an orchestrated way, and very smooth way, the impact on them is dramatic. I have a customer auto parts vendor that managed to reduce their delivery times to mechanic shop to 22 minutes. You can imagine now driving a car, you broke your mirror, you're going to the mechanic shop 22 minutes after that the mirror is there, within an hour or two, you're out. And that's a big, that's a big customer experience that they managed to achieve. So obviously now their sales is going significantly we have a phone company that they used to ship the SIM cards after a successful sales call. They used to ship SIM cards to the customers and it took them seven days to ship it. And something happens in the seven days and the conversion to activation and revenue recognition was very low. We reduced that down to two hours. And now the revenue, the activation and revenue recognition is, uh, is out the roof. And every implementation like that required allies of allies of uh, vendors to come together and serve them. So now when I look into the future and I make my one plus one equals two and even more, I actually see a movement, a movement of the entire market, market forces coming together into a connected platform in order to provide a viable alternatives to Amazon, to Instacart, to all those market places out there. I believe that we, the market forces are so much bigger than even Amazon itself. Amazon is one. We are many. But when we bring all of us into a connected platform, we will still compete one with another, one fleet with another fleet. But instead of competing by direct relationship, we all expose our capacity in one connected platform. That will lead to a big innovation. I like to compare that with iPhone and Android. Yeah. So I thought it started as a closed platform. The market realized that very quickly. And the next thing you know, Android started to develop as a movement, attracted all the different companies that compete one with another to collaborate on an open platform. Next thing you know, fast forward a few years, and now Android is, such, it is so much bigger than iPhone itself. So I can talk to you about a lot of innovation, but I think this model it's a question of time, and it will eventually stick, uh, and we'll see a lot of those forces coming together. So if you were sitting yeah. across from a CEO, from a large grocery retailer, what advice would you give him or her? First of all, don't wait. I was in a panel just a couple of months ago in Miami, and I had the same question. I had many CEOs in the room, and my message to them, first of all, as many CEOs, it was a C-level panel, and the first thing I say, just don't wait. The market is changing. The market is changing in front of you. You have to do something. Every day that passes, it's a day that you fall behind, and you have to wake up to that. So don't wait, do something. When you decide to do something, please, please, I said it very clearly, don't try to do it yourself. Don't try to do it yourself. It takes a very deep product vision 
I almost compare that to the rule of the 10,000 hours, which is anything you do 10,000 hours, you will become the best you can be. But it is what it is. You are a grocer, you know, the technology player. Allow those that have the 10,000 hours to come and help you. So don't try to do it yourself. It requires very complex technologies. It will take you time to market. It will take you easy uh, 12 to 18 months to put it together. And meanwhile, you lose time to value, you lose the product vision, the innovation, whatever you create will never be good enough to what the market is introducing. The third thing, if you decide not to do it yourself, please don't do it with point solutions. Don't try to take a bit from here and a bit from there and try to piece the puzzle together because that takes integrations, that takes upgrades and updates and maintenance and it's, it's heavy. And in the end, when you put all of that together, you will still not get the cutting edge innovation that you want. So it's again, it's a compromise. My suggestion for CEOs, understand that this is no longer a nice to have, it's a strategic necessity, and you should approach it strategically by looking at a platform. You have to adopt a platform, because as a platform that digitizes and connects all those moving pieces into one place, you're turning a very complex problem to a data problem. And then you let the algorithms always find the most efficient answer to you. So my suggestion approach is strategically, save the time, start small, don't boil the ocean, take up applications, perfect it. Are you happy? Did you achieve what you wanted? Awesome. Give a green light and scale to all your uh, locations. Well, that's great advice. Now, Guy, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. How do people get a hold of you? Uh, Guy, G-Y, at bring, the 2G, B-R-I-N-G-G dot com. Just send me an email. I'm very accessible and happy to hear anyone. And then uh, go on my LinkedIn. Follow my uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I, I try to put a post out there every week and share a bit about the vision and where we see the market heading in the next few years. Uh, at the same time, responding to a lot of the news items that are out there. So very interesting conversations that we have there. So these are the two ways I suggest people to follow. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us on our show today. I would encourage you definitely to go follow Guy on his LinkedIn profile. He is a visionary in this space, and certainly the information that he's putting out there is valuable for anyone that's trying to tackle certain challenges. And Mark, how do people get a hold of us? A usual way, www.mercatus.com, M-E-R-C-A-T-U-S.com. Peace, everyone. Bye-bye.